Who's in control of your life this morning is a big question that is being answered as we speak. Somebody's in control, that's for sure. I think that we'd all like to have that control, but for most of us, we understand that we're not. There are other factors in our life that we wish we could change in order for us to gain more control of our life. That's why some of us don't enjoy the job that we have, because uh, we're under our boss's control. That's why some of us disdain our mother-in-law or our husband. Uh, for some, it's children are in control of the life. They're the ones dictating things. Others, it may be uh, something inanimate like a, a pile of money or insurance or whatever the case may be. Uh, but we all wish that we could be in control, and then Jesus comes along and just ruins the whole thing for us, demanding full control of our lives all the way down to our very schedule. He wants to have control of all of you, uh, every part of your life. That would include your calendar. If you've ever wondered how our five-day work week came about here in America, uh, Henry Ford was largely responsible for that. He set the precedent uh, all the way back in 1926 uh, by making Saturday and Sunday both to be days off for his workers. And he was the one that established uh, the 40-hour work week, really. Um, a few years after that, in 1932, the United States officially got on board with that idea and adopted the five-day work week as the standard, and it still holds today. Uh, you go all the way back to uh, several years before Henry Ford and find that um, a, a mill in New England... Uh, allowed a two-day weekend so that the Jewish staff that worked at the mill could observe the Sabbath. <clears throat> you know that Christians celebrate Sunday as the Lord's Day because that was the day that Jesus was resurrected, but Saturday was long held by the Jewish people as sacred. Saturday, Sabbath. And so it's because we live in a Judeo-Christian society that we have a two-day weekend, really. And uh, that, for the most part, means for you and I that we spend, generally speaking, five out of seven days a week under someone else's authority. Uh, assuming that you're a working person or even a student, um, you're cleaning for somebody, you're managing for somebody, teaching or building or assembling stuff. I don't know what it is that everybody does. But we give that five days to somebody else uh, to do something we'd rather not do. Uh, and I think somewhere along the way, we've come to assume that weekends are for all the things that we want to do. Us good Christians, we set aside a few hours on Sunday and give that to the Lord. Uh, but what does the afternoon look like? And what does the day before look like? I, I think we oftentimes give very little regard to what God thinks about what we do with our time, let alone Saturday, Sunday, what have you, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we don't really want God to interfere with every day of the week, right? I mean, we want some downtime. We want some mean me time. And so uh, we have those days, whether it's religious or not. Uh, I bring all this up because this is precisely the case for the, of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. This is a, a Sabbath issue. They're going to contend with Jesus about how their Saturday looks. And man, this is a classic case of something that has been plaguing God's people ever since. And before. I, I mean, we are guarded about our time. And even when God does want to dictate how things look, we want to dictate how the things that God wants actually look. It's a very messy situation, but nonetheless, we look to Scripture for help. Back to verse 1, it says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. <laughs> it's Saturday. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat, which apparently you weren't supposed to do on Saturday. And so here come the Pharisees out of nowhere. I mean, I don't know. These guys just following Jesus just to find something wrong with him and his friends. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, look at your disciples. Look at them. Do you see what they're doing? They're doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. 
just wanted you to know. <laughs> just wanted to point that out. Oh, how we can sometimes find such great satisfaction in pointing out to Jesus the problems that other people have. Hey, Jesus, I come to you humbly in prayer, broken, uncontrite in spirit, and I want you to know how awful these people are that you're forcing me to deal with. So, just do something about them. Failing to realize the heart from which those words so easily sprang. These Pharisees are straight up evil. And they are simply looking to cause trouble, corner Christ, find something on which they can literally hang him. And they won't let this issue go. I mean, this will be a perennial issue from the beginning of Christ's ministry all the way to the very end. One nitpicky issue that they won't let go. And it will eventually be Christ's crucifixion and the Pharisees' undoing. Now, to set the context, I want you guys to remember where we are in Matthew's narrative, okay? Jesus is just simply walking through a field. He's leading a team of no less than 12 men on a uh, mission, really. And they're going through hostile territory. Grain fields, generally speaking, aren't supposed to be hostile territory. They're supposed to be spaces in which food and nourishment is provided for the masses. But no, not here. And Jesus is in it, and his disciples are in it, and they're doing God's work, and so it becomes a very tumultuous environment. Isn't that funny? How you can take the most peaceful, what's supposed to be some of the most pleasant situations, and turn them sour on a moment's notice because of a rotten heart. Jesus is taking these men on a mission uh, and yet they're under constant surveillance. They're being watched all the time, whether they knew it or not. Everything they do is being monitored. Everything that's being done is scrutinized by these Pharisees. Okay? Uh, by chapter 12, Christianity isn't illegal yet in first century Israel. But quite literally, the government is already looking for a good reason to make it so. These Pharisees, the lawmakers, the scribes, they all hate Christ. And of course, by extension, then they hate anyone who's loyal to him. This is true even today, even in a day and age when Jesus isn't physically around. Anyone who's loyal to the invisible Jesus is going to be hated by people who have problems with their heart like the Pharisees did. People hate Christ's disciples. Well, they're on mission. The mission is this. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in, in this way. The mission of Christ with these men is to introduce people to the one and only God they think they already know but don't. That's what Jesus is doing in first century. He's walking around introducing people who think they know God to the God they don't even know. It's his job now to, with his disciples, convince men and women who rely on their own morality, put confidence in their own religious performance, people who are familiar with Scripture and all the rest, those who, according to Paul's description in Romans chapter 2, are convinced that they're a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness, like they just speak with eloquence and wisdom. Listen to me! People who think they can instruct the ignorant and teach children, young people, the ways of God. Because they assume that they have complete knowledge and truth when they, in fact, don't. And Christ's mission, along with his disciples, is to help these people see that they don't. How is that accomplished? It doesn't matter if it's a 1st century or the 21st century. It's accomplished through teaching, and Jesus is doing plenty of that, and preaching, Jesus and his boys are doing plenty of that, and miracles. And let me add to the list. How does Jesus convince people that they don't know God when they think they do? Teaching, preaching, miracles, and by coming face to face with them. 
That's why Jesus is always on the move. So that they can come face to face with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the very image of God. That's what, that's what Scripture says about Jesus, that when you look at him, you're looking at God. Jesus is the, quote, exact imprint of God's nature. So that's how he's able to help people see that they don't actually believe in the God of the Bible. And again, he's doing the same thing now. Teaching, preaching, the activities of the Holy Spirit among God's people, and coming face to face with those who not only bear God's image but possess his Holy Spirit, those in this life who are Christ-like. We may not be Christ, but we, the, we are the embodiment of him so when you come face to face with a disciple and you're, you're rubbed the wrong way and, and you just don't like th that they do that or they say it that way or they, and you got a problem with God's people, then you got a problem with God himself because we are, Christians are the body of Christ. It was always planned that Jesus would go away and that the church would operate here on this earth in his stead. So again, people are going to have a problem with his disciples. The mission that they're on, no easy task, ladies and gentlemen. No easy task then or now. Because anyone who's truly on mission with Jesus Christ is going to experience pushback from the masses. We have Pharisees. We don't call them Pharisees, but there are many a Pharisee out there. They are alive and well. The spirit of the Pharisee is alive and well 2,000 years later. Okay? There is opposition to Christ's mission that is even greater than our text this morning suggests. You know why? Because you and I would be inclined to think that the Pharisees are the problem. But a closer look at New Testament truth says otherwise. It isn't the Pharisees. Ephesians chapter 6 says that our real struggle isn't against people. It's against demons. And if you think that God's Holy Spirit can influence men and women, you'd better believe that the devil can do the same thing with other men and other women. So in our text this morning, Satan is using the Pharisees that we read about to harass and distract and, if it's possible, altogether prevent Christ's disciples from going any further in the ministry. The devil would have Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, all the boys be stopped in their tracks. The devil, if it was possible, would have them starve to death in the middle of the grain field. Take no further steps with Jesus Christ. Because they're becoming a threat. I'll tell you, these Pharisees aren't accusing the disciples of violating the Sabbath because they're concerned about the integrity of God's word. They're doing it for other reasons. They're trying to destroy them. Destroy the ministry. Stop the mission. Obliterate their spiritual confidence in Christ. Right? If the devil can discourage them while they're still in training, then he doesn't have to worry about what they'll do once they've been given the Great Commission. He can see the path that they're on just as well as he can see the path that you're on. Some of you, the path you're on is no threat at all. He'll let you continue. Others of you, you will experience pushback. You're becoming familiar with spiritual warfare. It's becoming difficult. It's getting hot. And there's a reason for it. The devil would stop you in your tracks because he knows where this path goes. I'd like to believe that this church introduces you to a path called discipleship that we offer you to walk on with us and Christ that will cause you to make a stir in the kingdom of darkness. You will catch attention. The devil doesn't want them or any of Christ's modern disciples to reach the end of that road. If he can stop you before you get three steps in, that's a win for him. 
And that's why, personally speaking to some of you, that's why he is working so hard to keep you right where you're at. The devil is wanting to stop you in your tracks. He doesn't want you to keep going. He wants to keep you from taking that next step. And some of you, you might already know what that next step is, and you're scared. And that should prove to you that there is a spirit involved in that decision. Am I right? Who's given you a spirit of fear? Are you a biblical student? Do you know the answer to that question? The Bible says plainly, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, so why are you afraid? Because the devil's involved and he doesn't want you to go any step further. And there are so many Christians who walked so far with Christ and then got so afraid of where this went that they stopped in their tracks. Some have stopped for months, even years, out of straight-up fear. Listen to me. If you don't think that the disciples weren't freaked out right there in that field when the Pharisees came and went, Look! They broke the Sabbath! Because every Jew knew what it meant to break the Sabbath. Do you know what it meant back then to break the Sabbath? Do you? Execution. Death row. That's it. So, so when these Pharisees popped up like gophers and pointed the fire, what are the disciples doing? What's going through their mind? They're looking to Jesus like, save us. Save us. Like I've always said that, you know, there's salvation that begins your journey with Christ. Like salvation, it starts with getting saved. But you need to keep getting saved all along the way. Jesus is going to bring you into very dangerous territory, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, perhaps physically, where you're going to need him to save you again and again. It, 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 it is that hazardous to walk with Christ, that you will need his rescue time and time again. Here's, here's one such case with his disciples. They've been following Christ for some time. They already got that out of the way. They have faith in Jesus, okay, enough to follow. And so they're following. And now charges have been brought against them that could land them on death row. The devil will use anything he can to keep you from going any further with Christ and to stop you from becoming any more of a threat than you already are. I'm speaking to my disciples in this church. I hope you understand that wherever you are. I'm looking for you. The devil will use anything, and mark my words, anything at all to stop you. Here, in this case, he's using lunch. Lunch for crying out loud. If he can stop these disciples <laughs> by condemning them over what they had for lunch, the devil has a lot of confidence in his ability to stop you. In verse 3, Jesus then comes to their defense because, guys, that's what Jesus does, isn't it? You need to be saved. Jesus is delighted to save, whether it's that first initial salvation that begins the journey with Christ as a follower of, of him or any subsequent saving that you need along the way. And I'm not saying save from the penalty of sin. That happens once. But you need to be saved over and over and over. God, help me. God, rescue me. Oh, no, I'm in trouble again. I made a bad mistake. God, oh. Jesus delights in coming to the rescue. That's why they call him Savior. Like some people have nicknames that, that kind of latch onto them because of their character, kind of who they are. One of them for Jesus is Savior. His proper name is Jesus. His full name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. But we all call him Savior. Why? Because that's what he does. He just does it all the time. He says to them, the Pharisees, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God, right? And ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Like, did you read the Bible, you guys? Note the sarcasm here. When Jesus says to the Bible experts of his day, have you not read? That's a total slam on them. 
These are the people who in the entire country thought that they knew the Bible better than anybody else, and this carpenter comes and goes, you guys should read the Bible. Have you? It's a good book. First Samuel actually has a story in it about David and some hungry dudes that were with him, and if you would have read that, you did read that, didn't you? How embarrassing for these Pharisees. Humiliating. Again, I tell you that the disciples at this point are greatly relieved because they see that Jesus is defending them when there had been criminal charges brought against them. And again, the penalty for breaking Sabbath was execution. According to Old Testament law, Exodus 31.15 says, Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. And that isn't the only instance where that is recorded in the Old Testament. Over and over, it says that those who work on the Sabbath should be executed. In Numbers chapter 15, we read an account of a man who actually violated the Sabbath law. By gathering sticks to build a fire. Gathering sticks to build a fire, either to warm himself or his family or to cook food. To, I mean, it seems so innocent, doesn't it? He was gathering sticks to build a fire. It was in violation. Moses sought the Lord on what to do, and the Lord responded by saying that man should be stoned with stones. Kill him. But here, Christ's disciples are spared. God's word comes to the rescue. And Jesus references several passages here to justify his disciples, beginning with 1 Samuel chapter 21. Jesus defends them. It's the word of God that condemns you. It's the word of God that defends you. Did you understand? I mean, when you read the Bible, does it rip you to shreds? Because it ought to. Because it's meant to. And does the Word of God put you back together? Again, it ought to. Because it's meant to. And though it can condemn, it can also save. Now, the key to their survival as they traverse this grain field wasn't the grain they ate. Like, they were hungry, and had they not eaten any food, they would eventually starve to death. We all know how biology works. No food, you die, eventually. But the key to their survival wasn't the grain they ate. The key to their survival that day was the Word of God. And this is, I believe, what Jesus meant when he said, man does not live on bread alone. Do you need bread to live? Yeah. Is that all? No! We desperately need the Word of God, the truth of God, to save us from the death that we'll incur if we don't have it. Just like food. Death is inevitable if you don't have food. So too, if you don't have the truth of God's word. That's why it's so vital, you guys, to understand God's word. Not just to know it. Not just to know it. The Pharisees knew it. The key is to understand God's word. The Pharisees failed to understand it. They knew it. They knew 1 Samuel 21. They failed to know how to apply it, to understand it. What they failed to understand was that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Jesus would go on to tell us as much. In verse 5, Jesus continues his argument in defense of his men. He says, or have you not read? Again, he says, haven't you read? Like it's all over in the Bible if you would just read your Bible. Like, if you're ignorant of the Bible, you're at fault. No one can read the Bible for you. No one can study the Bible for you. No one can understand the Bible for you. It's your responsibility. And if you're ignorant of what Scripture says, yes, even the Old Testament, that's on you. The Old Testament passage of 1 
Samuel 21, saved the New Testament disciples' lives. So if you're one of those people, off chance, I'm going off script here. If you're one of those people that thinks the New Testament is the only part of the Bible that counts, you're a dead man walking. Know your Bible. Jesus says, have you not read? Twice now. Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and they're blameless? The priests are violating the Sabbath all the time, Jesus says. Well, what were they doing that was a violation of the Sabbath? Well, they were lighting fires according to the laws of, of the sacrificial system and all the ceremonies of, of Jewish law. They were lighting fires. You weren't supposed to do that. They were killing animals. Okay? Aren't supposed to do that. Anybody who went deer hunting this weekend knows how much of a chore it is to go out and kill a simple deer. You know what I mean? And then try cutting the thing up. You gotta lift it. You gotta pull the guts out. It's bloody. It's hard work. By the end, you're like, we should just buy beef next year. <laughs> They're lifting carcasses. They're doing all kinds of other duties that are forbidden. And they get away with it. Jesus goes, well, they get, they get away with it. Jesus is saying, you don't even keep the rules you've made. You don't even keep the laws that there are, you priests. You hold others, like my disciples, to a higher standard than you hold yourself to. You get leniency all the time when it works in your favor. How many Christians are playing that game right now? You get leniency all the time when it works in your favor, but you're quick to condemn everybody else. Do you understand how Jesus feels about that? Even if it's you. Like you've been told all your life, Jesus loves me. Um, sometimes he's really angry with people. And if you're akin to the, if, if, you, if, if you're just a chip off the old Pharisee block, he ain't happy. If that fits your description, well, Jesus is revealing their hypocrisy. That's what he's doing. Jesus loves to, to reveal hypocrisy. Why? Um, not to just belittle people and, and embarrass people, but so that he can get to work in people. Uh, you'll never repent of your hypocrisy if you don't first see that it's there. No one goes in and gets treated for a cancer they don't know exists. It's not until they're diagnosed, not until they see the MRI. And, you know, then they're willing to take in all the chemo. They're willing to lose their hair. They're willing to puke every day. They're willing to face excruciating pain. Go under the knife, cut it out, do whatever, lose half my liver. Why? Because I got cancer, that's why. You'd never do that until you realized you had it. Same, to, same thing with hypocrisy. Jesus is revealing their hypocrisy so that they can hopefully be saved from it. And there's no other way to reveal hypocrisy in a person than to strike a blow to your self-righteousness. You're a hypocrite. That's why, boy, by the time we get to Matthew 23, Jesus is livid. He's going to be screaming at them about their hypocrisy. Why? Because they wouldn't pay any attention to it being revealed all the way back to chapter 12. And if Jesus is trying to reveal in you the, uh, the hypocritical game that you're playing and you won't have it and you're going to plant your feet and you're going to cross your arms and you're going to be stubborn, well, your chapter 23 is coming. There's going to come a day when Jesus is livid with you and he's going to scream at you. I highly suggest you repent when he reveals it. These men that he's confronting here are entirely egocentric. And I know that America doesn't produce any egocentric men or women, so I'm speaking to you know, the choir. But, just in case, your ego is a danger to you. He's confronting their ego. And that's why he says what he says next. Verse 6. He says, I'm telling you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. And I can imagine him taking just one step back from these guys and going, Pah. you know, he's in a grain field, by the way. You know, in the Jewish mind, what's a grain field compared to their temple? Their temple was just holiness, you know, in a grain field. And Jesus goes, you want to know the truth? Standing right here in the middle of this acreage is somebody who's far greater than your temple. That's like taking a sword and just sticking it in the heart of their hypocrisy. Jesus says, if I may paraphrase, I'm more important than what you believe is most important. That's what he's saying to them. I'm more important than your stupid temple. I'm more important than the thing that you have come to worship over and above God. 
And he would say the same thing to you and me this morning. Jesus has the audacity, the arrogance, to claim to be more important than what you think is most important. So, consider what you believe to be most important right now. If you have kids, is it your kids? You have a good job? I mean, really, is your job really, really important to you? Jesus goes, nothing compared to me. Your family? <laughs> nothing compared to me. Your life? Oh, boo-hoo. What an insult. If you're not insulted, you're not getting the text. These guys are so deeply insulted, they want to murder him. You do not speak to me like that. They don't outright say it, but that's what their heart is speaking. You don't say that to me. Slight my temple. Speak that way of my family. So what is it for you? What's most important? Jesus would have you know this morning that he's far more important than anything. In verse 7 he says, but if you had known what this means... And this was a verse, Hosea 6.6. 6. This is a verse that they were all familiar with. <laughs> and Jesus goes, you don't even get it. I mean, you've read it. Yeah, you probably wrote it on a scroll and sealed it up in a little vial and hammered it to your door, you good Jew. But you have no clue what I meant by it. Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He says, if you had understood, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless, which you just did. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire this, not that. Okay, God has desires. Just plain and simple. God has desires, just like you do. You know that we were made in God's image and we all have desires, don't we? We just do. We all have desires. That's because we're made in the image of God. God has desires. But generally speaking, there are very few people that are aware of what God's desires are. These Pharisees weren't. They didn't know what God actually wanted, even though the Bible plainly told them. God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. But they weren't aware of that, and they just continue on with the sacrifices and keep doing all this stuff, and God would do it by the book, and oh yeah. And God goes, that's not, I wish I had something different out of you. And a lot of people, just like these Pharisees, even in 2022, a lot of people who just do religion, they just do Christianity, without ever really knowing what God actually wants. They just go to church, oblivious to whether or not God's pleased with it. They get involved at church without any consideration of how God might want them to be involved, to what extent God would have them be involved. And we don't care what God actually wants. We care what we want. And so there are few people who are aware of what God's desires are, fewer people than that who even care. Truth be told, they would rather carry on, in many cases, with a dry, meaningless religion than to live a life that actually pleases God. They don't care what God likes. They're just trying to buy him off with Christianity. One author says, The only function that ceremony ever has is as an illustration of a right attitude. If you never get to the right attitude, you miss the whole purpose of the ceremony. If coming to church doesn't help to cultivate a right attitude in you, then church is worthless. Same is true of reading your Bible. Same is true of serving God in and through the church. Same is true of being on mission. The last three weeks of my life may have been a waste if it has no effect on my heart. The things that we do for God matter very little if it isn't being done with the right heart. And once we do come to the right attitude... The ceremony, generally speaking, is no longer needed. Right? Like, you think about it in terms of getting married. There is the ceremony, and then there is the 
attitude. Okay. The ceremony is the wedding. Right? Matt and Susan just had a little ceremony, and that's all well and good. But I sure hope that they actually had the right attitude going into that ceremony. I hope there was love and affection and kindness and consideration and passion and all those things. Because uh, if there isn't, then you tell me, what good is the ceremony? Might as well have gone to Las Vegas for insurance reasons. Right? Right? Yet if the attitude is there, the ceremony is no longer needed. That's why people, generally speaking, get married once. Like, I don't have to remarry Sarah every day, right? I don't have to, you know, annual re-up, you know, like time to, hey, you guys, I'm sorry, but we got to do this again. You know, come in, and I walk down the aisle, Sarah walks down the aisle. You know, we don't need to do that annually. And Jesus is saying the same thing here. If you had the right heart, you wouldn't have to come here to this temple every year and sacrifice another goat. He's just wore out with this attitude that we have. That we can buy him off with a good performance. And, you know, I, and the Pharisees are just missing the point. Sabbath. Oh, you violated the Sabbath. And Jesus is going, that's your law. Can't eat grain on the Sabbath. You kidding me? That's man's law, not God's. And I'll tell you this. Those who put laws on themselves like that, that God never intended, they are the ones who end up being the most offended by other people's liberty. These Pharisees are just put off by the fact that the, the disciples of Christ can eat on the Sabbath. They can just go through the and they can, they can pick, which is harvesting. They can rub it in their hands, which, which is threshing. And then blow the chaff away, which is winnowing. And then, and then eat. Oh, I can't believe they do all that work. That's a, you can't, you're not supposed to. I mean, that's, you mean I could have been doing that all along? I didn't have to starve myself. I didn't have to be, you know, glum on Saturday. I didn't have to be holy. I could have been enjoying myself. I could have been enjoying God. No, that's, that's, you can't do that. Everybody has to be miserable like me. And that's the sum total of some people's Christianity. Miserable. Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Verse 8. Jesus is claiming full authority over their precious Saturday. He's saying, I decide how the Sabbath looks, not you. That's what he just said here. Again, very offensive. I decide how the Sabbath looks, not you. So, huh, so now there's a, a power struggle, a battle for control between the Pharisees and Jesus over who gets to decide how Saturday looks. And I wonder how many people in here are in that same power struggle with Jesus over who gets to decide how their Saturday looks or their Sunday or their Monday all the way through Friday and Friday night, by the way, because Jesus is still on duty when the sun goes down. Jesus is more than Lord of the Sabbath, right? Jesus is Lord of the week, all seven days. Jesus is Lord of each of the 12 months and every year, even the 0.25 part of the day every four years. You know, we have a leap year. He, he's got leap day too. So there's no, there's no square on the calendar that Jesus doesn't lay claim to. And he won't compromise God's word to accommodate these Pharisees. Jesus is not going to compromise God's word. But the Pharisees don't want Jesus calling the shots. And so you got this classic power struggle that a lot of people do. Uh, and, and again, uh, you may be one of those individuals wanting to keep your life the same as it's always been. And, you know, this is how I do it. And then anytime that Jesus challenges you, you contest it which is precisely what's happening in our passage this morning. And so when he does that, as with the Pharisees, the whole life, the, it's just, 
any interactions with Christ is one of resistance. You know what Jesus is calling you to do, and you don't want to do it, and so you, you get all amped up. You don't want to listen. You got your agenda, and they, he needs to change, not me. He, he, the problem is on that side of the table, and not on this side of the table. No, 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 no. And so you got people who their whole Christian life follow Jesus but hate it because it interferes with the life that they want to live. And I wonder if that sounds familiar to anybody in here. Really because there's two kinds of people who follow Jesus through this field that we call life. Those who endorse the truth, those who endorse the truth by giving up their lives and those who endorse themselves by denying the truth. Which one are you? Well, they leave the field, and Jesus then, in verse 9, goes into their synagogue. Their synagogue. Jesus is now on their turf. He deliberately goes into this establishment, this place of worship. There's going to be an altercation there. Jesus, in his foresight, knew it was coming, but he went anyway. And so Jesus goes into their domain. It's one thing for them to follow Jesus and his disciples out into a field, but now Jesus has come into their space. He's invading their territory. He's uh, getting nosy, barging into their routine, pushing his way into their life. We would call that encroachment. It's a Sunday afternoon football term encroachment. You've crossed the line. You stay out there and you leave me alone in here. Now they've compartmentalized their life and Jesus doesn't even know what that is. Compartments? Like this part of your life is for you and then I get to hang out with you over here. No. In fact, Jesus is going to see those areas of your life where you've tried to put up barriers and, and where you've put keep out signs and he's going to storm the gate. That's where he's going. That's why people have to work so hard in their conscience to deny the truth of what they know when Jesus and his Holy Spirit try to interfere with their sex life. with the things that they do when no one else is around. That's actually where Jesus is. He sees, and he don't like what he sees, and he knows it's a hostile environment, but he's going there anyway. He will find you on your, tur on your turf, and he doesn't care what it's going to do to him or his reputation. And so he goes into their synagogue. And behold, that's a word that authors use in Scripture when they want you to, like, get this. <laughs> when something's coming, that's like a big deal. So, behold, like, get this, you guys. There was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked Jesus, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because <laughs> they wanted to accuse him. So, that's the big setup. Behold. It's a Sabbath issue again, absolutely hung up on this, this one little issue. And that's how it is with some people. They don't like Jesus, and Jesus keeps poking them about that issue, and it just keeps coming around over and over and over and again. And, and, and until that person changes, Jesus won't. They, had, they took issue with him about the Sabbath in the field. Now they're going to take issue with him about the Sabbath in the synagogue, and they're going to keep taking issue with him about the Sabbath. Why? Because Jesus ain't going to leave you alone about your issue until you change. He won't. D do you really think that you're strong enough to withstand him for the rest of your life? Because you will one day die. That's God saying, time for you to die. And when that's over, he just keeps going. God's eternal. But you only get one short life in which to repent. You can plant your feet. You don't have to. He's not going to force you to. But when he confronts you about your issue and you won't deal with it, 
he will bring it around again and you will be confronted again with that same issue. People who do that all their life, they end up, if you could graph this on, on paper, it would look like a dog chasing its tail. Some people, they're just kind of like... <laughs> In verse 11, Jesus said to them, he doesn't even speak to the man with the withered hand. He just looks at the Pharisees. And he says, what man is there among you? And this is a good point. Who has a sheep? Falls into the pit on Sabbath and you wouldn't drag it out? That's lifting, isn't it? Last time I checked, that's work, right? According to the books, right? Yes. Check the Talmud. Check the books. But you'd do it anyway, wouldn't you? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Now, when Jesus asks you a question like that, that's as rhetorical as that one is, you'd better answer him. How much more value is a man than a sheep? And don't play 21st century hippie. Well, sheep are, they're really, I mean, they're, they're, they have a life too, and everybody has life, and, and cats and dogs. and Just, just so you're all aware, Jesus Jesus thinks that people are far more valuable than his animals, and he owns animals, and so he gets to decide. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Boy, there's a lot of people in my generation that would get that answer wrong. But back then, they understood. And so he concludes his argument by saying, well then... That's why it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You'd save a sheep, right? Yep. Then would it be okay if I saved his hand? So he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. This actually reveals how evil their heart was. And Jesus has a way of revealing publicly how evil your heart is when you become stubborn to the truth and resistant to the Holy Spirit. He will publicly embarrass you. How evil is their heart? Well, it seems to me that they're more interested in keeping themselves out of trouble than helping those who are in trouble. That's opposite of Christ's approach. Jesus would get himself into trouble to help you and I out of it. Right? Jesus became poor so that we could become rich. Jesus faced the wrath of God so that we could be delivered from it. Right? I mean, that's Jesus' M.O. He wasn't self-protective in the least. If you read anything about Jesus, you have to come to the conclusion that he wasn't a very self-protective man. He exposed himself to the utmost. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. He wasn't afraid of what it would do to his reputation to heal this man. He wasn't concerned about whether helping this man on Saturday would get him in trouble or not. He wouldn't dare withhold good from a man to protect himself from hostile men. He knew it would put them in a rage, and it did. He knew that they would plot to destroy him, and they did. It appears at first that these guys are acting like they are because they're, they're being very careful about offending God. They don't want to offend God. They're extra careful at the synagogue. They're ultra-obedient. They go so far as to follow rules that aren't even there. I mean, it looks good, right? It's all so pious. And for that reason, everyone else that's in the synagogue leaves them alone. But I hope we can see in this passage that there's more to it, folks. They're playing a game. It's a ruse. It's a cover. They're evil. Beneath that ultra-religious veneer, is a wicked heart that actually hates Jesus, who beneath the carpentry veneer is actually God. 
They're resistant to his leadership. They want nothing to do with it. They are defiant of God's word. Jesus proved it in three passages. One, two, three. No one should be surprised to find that kind of evil in the synagogue. In fact, that's a kind of evil that can only be found in a synagogue or a church. This kind of hypocrisy that's veiled beneath religion, it can only be found in a synagogue or church because it pretends to be devout. And so that's where the pretenders go to put on their religious costume. It's not rare that this should happen. It's everywhere in the church. You know that mold grows best where it's moist. Self-righteousness also thrives in particular environments. Self-righteousness breeds in the house of God. If we could only see through spiritual lenses at what we're dealing with, I think that we would find a lot of mold in the modern church. A lot of people who hate Jesus because he interferes with their life too much. He's too demanding. He wants total control. And some people have had enough working for a boss. Their job is hard enough. Their marriage is hard enough. They don't have enough me time. They don't want to give any of it to Jesus, the little that they do have. They don't want Jesus to have total control. They don't care whether he's Lord of the Sabbath. They don't want him to be Lord of their Sunday. They don't want him to be Lord of the week. They certainly don't want him to be Lord of the entire calendar. And Jesus, Jesus lays claim to every, every bit of it. In verse 14, the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. No surprise there. Some people are just so reluctant to give control of their weekend to Jesus that they won't have it. But I'm telling you, Jesus does have it. Jesus is calling the shots. He is deciding how their Sabbath looks. They accosted him in the field. He accosts them in the synagogue. They can't get away. Jesus is Lord. And I'm, I'm going to say this because it needs to be said. You don't make him Lord. You know, you've heard that before. Christian evangelism often asks the question, Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? <laughs> it's not your job. God already did. It says, I believe in the book of Acts, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Savior. God made Jesus Lord. So the question isn't whether you've made Jesus Lord. Uh, the fact is, God did. And since God did, we have responsibilities. Is Jesus confronting you today? Is he revealing in you spaces of hypocrisy? that he wants to get to work on? And, and if so, if so, if Jesus is helping to bring certain things to your attention this morning, then the bigger question is, how are you responding to that? Will you humble yourself and repent and learn and adjust your understanding of Scripture to fit his beliefs? that you might grow and become more Christ-like? Or are you expecting him to adjust his perception and understanding of Scripture to fit your beliefs? Because you just... We all have room to grow. Okay? You need to understand that within every one of our breasts lies a, a, a pharisaic heart. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you, but don't think that you're done contending against the Pharisee in you. It's there. And if you would deny that, you've only proven the point.